Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ivo Mila, and I'm beyond honored today to host the Zero Water Data Center by 2030 Mission Impossible event organized by Scaleway. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about an incredibly important topic, and we have a lineup of very knowledgeable people that can tell you a bit more about why it really matters for you to be informed on the topic. Well, many public policies and industries initiatives at national, European and even global level have been focusing on data center efficiency. Um, water consumption remains an overlooked topic. Um, and in most discussions concerning the digital sector, the environmental footprint, we're talking about energy, we're talking about um, compensation, but really water is not at the prime of our focus. This is why uh, the first goal of this event, by gathering a wide variety of speakers uh, with different perspectives and different backgrounds, is to put essentially words to this uh, phenomena, to the problem that we're going to be discussing, give an analysis, present an analysis in full transparency about the current situation, and to start digging into the potential evolution perspectives and solutions for the problem. The event is taking place in the context of the EU Green Week, uh, whose overall team is zero pollution. Uh, how can we get there? Um, we're still not quite sure, and there's a lot of work to be done ahead of all of us. Um, and hopefully today, by demystifying the topic of the zero water data centers, we can make a step towards improving that. The event is going to be divided in three parts. We have first a fantastic and very important keynote uh, by uh, Vincent uh, Thibault, um, I'm going to present him in a second. We also have four speaker interventions, all having 10 minutes to present their view on a certain topic. And finally, we have a Q&A session. So for all of the people who are part of the audience uh, at the moment, I would kindly ask you to put your questions in uh, the section that is on your right hand side and put there all of the opinions or maybe concerns that you have about the things that are being discussed. So. Um, Today, I would like to present to you now our uh, fantastic speakers. Uh, I would first like to start with Marie Lo, uh, who is the Deputy Director of the French Water Partnerships. Uh, and uh, essentially, uh, she now is the Global Director, uh, Director General uh, since July, essentially 2019. Uh, our second speaker is uh, David uh, Mitton, uh, who is the co-founder of Consol. Uh, which launched early 2021 to provide the best tools for developers. Uh, from 2009 to 2018, David was also uh, the co-founder of Server Density, a London-based SaaS infrastructure monitoring startup who can shed some light on this particular part of, uh, of the topic. Um, we also have Arnaud, who is a serial net entrepreneur and investor, also the co-founder of uh, Scaleway, our host today, uh, where he serves as a chairman. He's also the founder of the telecom company Ovanet, uh, as well as a keen angel investor, a startup mentor and advisor. And um, we also have uh, such an incredible, uh, long and uh, very prominent lineup. Uh, we have Manuel Mateo Gouillet, who since 2019 is the deputy head of unit for cloud and software uh, at the European Commission. Uh, and DG Connect. Um, so next up, uh, I have the phenomenal honor uh, to welcome uh, on stage uh, the French MP Vincent Thibault, uh, who will be delivering uh, a speech that can give us a bit more context uh, about digital and environment. He has been a member of the French Parliament since 2017, uh, rapporteur on a law proposal on digital and environment, which focuses, amongst other topics, on reducing environmental footprint of data centers in France. So I would like to welcome uh, um, you for our fantastic keynote. Uh... Bonjour, je suis Vincent Thibault, député d'Alsace, membre de la Commission du développement durable et de l'aménagement du territoire à l'Assemblée nationale, et également rapporteur sur la loi qui vise à réduire l'impact environnemental du numérique en France. Tout d'abord, je permets de saluer votre participation à cette table ronde qui est à l'initiative de la société Skyway du groupe Iliad, qui s'est fixé comme thème, un thème ambitieux, celui de définir et voir comment nous pouvons arriver à l'horizon 2030 à des data centers qui ne consomment pas d'eau. Il s'agit bien là de parler de l'impact environnemental du numérique. 
Petit rappel du point de situation. En 2019, au niveau planétaire, le numérique représentait déjà plus de 4 milliards d'usagers, plus de 34 milliards de terminaux numériques, ce qui constitue plus de 15 millions de gaz à effet de serre qui ont été émis. Depuis, le numérique et ses usages ont fortement progressé. D'ailleurs, en 2020, les transferts de données ont progressé de plus de 30%. Certes, la période était particulière, mais on sait que cette progression va continuer dans les prochaines années. D'ailleurs, on estime qu'en 2040, les gaz à effet de serre issus du numérique et de ses usages vont progresser de plus de 60%, soit plus de 24 millions de tonnes de gaz à effet de serre qui seront émis. À l'heure actuelle, les gaz à effet de serre du numérique et de ses usages représentent 2% des émissions globales des gaz à effet de serre en France. Au niveau mondial, on estime que c'est 4%. C'est pour cela qu'à travers ce texte de loi, nous allons nous doter, nous avons l'ambition de nous doter d'outils, de méthodologies pour mieux mesurer, évaluer, contrôler et réguler l'impact environnemental du numérique. Ce texte, ce texte de loi est issu d'une mission parlementaire qui a été menée par trois sénateurs. Patrick Chaise en était le président, Guillaume Chevrolier, Jean-Michel Hougat, les deux rapporteurs. Et ils ont fait deux diagnostics principaux. Le premier, c'est qu'aujourd'hui, le numérique est l'angle mort des politiques environnementales en faveur de la baisse et de la réduction des émissions de gaz à effet de serre. Le deuxième, c'est qu'aujourd'hui, il nous est difficile de mesurer véritablement l'impact carbone du numérique. Pour cela, ils ont fait 25 recommandations. La plupart d'entre elles ont été reprises dans ce texte de loi qui a été examiné, discuté et voté au Sénat et qui est maintenant en cours de discussion à l'Assemblée nationale. J'en suis le rapporteur sur le fond pour la Commission du développement durable et Eric Bottorel, que je salue, en est le rapporteur pour avis pour la Commission des affaires économiques. Cette loi se compose de cinq chapitres. Le premier chapitre, c'est faire prendre conscience des impacts environnementaux du numérique à l'usager. On va dans ce chapitre notamment créer et mettre en place un observatoire du numérique qui va nous permettre de définir les outils pour mesurer et évaluer l'impact environnemental du numérique, mais aussi pour évaluer et mesurer les gains positifs du numérique, notamment dans la baisse et la réduction des émissions de gaz à effet de serre. Par exemple, aujourd'hui, nous sommes tous en distanciel. Imaginez si nous nous étions tous retrouvés au même endroit, ce que cela représentait en émissions de gaz à effet de serre en termes de transport. À titre de comparaison, sachez qu'un aller-retour Paris-Nice en avion représente deux ans de gaz à effet de serre d'un usager de numérique. On a notamment un autre point dans ce chapitre, qui est celui de mieux former et de former nos étudiants de l'enseignement supérieur à l'éco-conception et à la sobriété numérique. Car ce seront, ce seront eux qui, demain, vont concevoir et mettre en œuvre nos systèmes d'information. Deuxième chapitre, pour moi le plus important, c'est celui qui va consister à limiter le renouvellement des terminaux numériques. En effet, aujourd'hui, la fabrication des terminaux numériques représente 70% de l'impact environnemental du numérique. C'est considérable. C'est pour ça qu'il est essentiel que nous ayons des terminaux numériques qui soient plus durables, réparables et dont le renouvellement en est limité. À titre de comparaison, et pour exemple, sachez qu'aujourd'hui, le taux de renouvellement moyen en France d'un smartphone est de 23 mois. Dans le troisième chapitre, nous allons faire émerger des gestes et des usages vertueux du numérique en faveur de l'environnement, notamment en informant l'usager sur l'impact environnemental de l'utilisation de tel ou tel service numérique. Le quatrième chapitre, c'est tellement celui qui vous concerne le plus, c'est promouvoir des réseaux et des data centers qui soient 
moins énergivores, donc plus vertueux vis-à-vis -vis de l'environnement. Nous avons notamment un article dans lequel nous allons demander aux opérateurs de prendre un certain nombre d'engagements vertueux qui seront mesurés, évalués, contrôlés. Et s'ils si ne sont pas respectés, pourront faire l'objet de sanctions, notamment par l'ARSAP. Dans le cinquième chapitre, pardon, nous allons mettre en œuvre une stratégie du numérique responsable sur l'ensemble du territoire. Et ceci à travers les collectivités territoriales. Cette loi est inédite et nous permet aujourd'hui d'avoir une base pour mener à bien une politique en faveur d'un numérique responsable vis-à-vis -vis de l'environnement. Certes, ce n'est pas l'alpha et l'oméga des lois qui vont permettre de réduire massivement les émissions de gaz à effet de serre. Toutefois, elle s'inscrit dans un ensemble de dispositifs qui ont déjà été soit votés, mis en œuvre ou qui sont en cours de discussion, notamment au Parlement. Je pense à cela, à la loi anti-gaspillage économie circulaire qui a défini l'indice de réparabilité qui concerne l'ensemble des terminaux numériques, mais aussi la loi climat et résilience qui est en cours de discussion actuellement au Parlement. À travers cette loi aussi, la France confirme son leadership dans les politiques environnementales en faveur de la baisse et la réduction des émissions de gaz à effet de serre. Quand je parle de leadership, il est important aujourd'hui que la France, qui est largement observée, structée par nos amis et nos voisins européens, et notamment au Parlement européen sur les mesures qu'elle prend, puisse faire partager ces mesures, cette ambition. Car aujourd'hui, la lutte contre le changement climatique et la préservation de l'environnement est un combat qui doit se faire au niveau européen et au niveau mondial. Nous allons franchir, j'en suis convaincu, ces différentes étapes, tous ensemble. Ce leadership aussi se retrouve dans les initiatives des acteurs, notamment nationaux, que nous avons aujourd'hui dans le secteur du numérique. J'en ai fini pour ma part, parce que je pense que maintenant, après vous avoir fait ces propos liminaires, il est temps de laisser la place aux échanges que je sais qui seront riches, fructueux, et qui vont permettre justement, peut-être, de m'inspirer aussi dans le travail que je mène autour de cette loi à l'Assemblée nationale. C'est pour ça que je vous souhaite une très belle table ronde, de très bons échos, d'échanges, pardon, et je vous dis à bientôt. Merci. Fantastic and insightful piece of information. I think all of us can uh, uh, be excited and learn about uh, this new law. Uh, I think definitely uh, places and countries around Europe can benefit from copying this even. Um, now it's the time to uh, introduce the four interventions that we have. And uh, Marie-Laure, I would like to invite you to the stage uh, to tell us a bit more about your perspective about the water resources panorama um, and how this is impacted uh, by climate change. Um, what are, in your opinion, uh, the main lines of action to raise awareness on this? And how do you believe the tech sector has a role to play on this endeavor? Um, well, hello, everybody. First, it's, uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to, to be with you today. It's uh, quite unusual for um, a water person such uh, like me to um, participate to an event uh, or to webinar a conference on uh, data centers, actually. It's, uh, It's really the merit of Scaleway to, to have uh, organized this. Um, and uh, first, I'd, I just want to give you some information about um, who I represent. Uh, I think it's important. Wait a second. Um, so I'm the director of the French Water Partnership. And the French Water Partnership is a, a multi-stakeholder platform that uh, gathers uh, all sorts of stakeholders that are involved, that work on or with water, fresh water specifically. And so we're all French, but all working internationally. And so among our members, we have uh, ministries and uh, public administrations and uh, water agencies and uh, the French Agency for Development. We have the city of Paris, we have the CNRS, 
Um, we have uh, Suez, Veolia, EDF, but also startups um, working on innovation, uh, really doing state-of-the-art uh, things. We have NGOs, uh, Green or um, social um, international solidarity. Um, and um, so, yeah, so we, re I, I really, at the French Water Partnership represents the voice of all sorts of stakeholders. And I think it's important uh, to have this in mind when, uh, when you listen to me. Um, our mission is precisely to make sure that water issues are more, uh, are better taken into consideration in, in, in international agenda and climate change is one of them. But I think the first message I'd like to convey is that uh, put aside climate change, we are in any case in a context of what's commonly called a global water crisis. And I think it's important to, to, to say this, that, that climate change is just one of the issues, just one of the problems, and that water is a finite resource. Um, it's a finite resource, that it's a resource that can be polluted, and when, it, when polluted, it can really have very, very uh, devastating uh, consequences on all sorts of um, sectors for the environment, uh, but also we can't do anything with, with it anymore. Um, and sometimes it is the case, unfortunately. So I think it's also important to, to understand that freshwater resources are very unevenly distributed on Earth. It's not only uh, that it rains more in that region or that region. So the, there's groundwater that's unevenly distributed. It, of course, you have the, 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 the weather, the climate of uh, such and such region. But just to give you a fact and a figure that will be, I think, striking for, uh, for the audience, about 10 country, countries on Earth have 60% of all freshwater resources on their territories. So, uh, it's very unevenly uh, distributed. Um, it's more or less well managed from uh, one country and even one basin to the other. Um, and globally speaking, we are already using approximately 60% of all freshwater resources that are available with a demand going like that. And, and, and you see that I haven't even mentioned climate change. I'm talking about water consumption. I'm talking about uh, how much water we use to produce everything. And there are, you know, I've, I've read with a lot of interest the, um, the article in Nature uh, that was really uh, eye-opening for me on the, on, the, on the sector of data center. Um, but yes, you need a lot of water to produce about everything. You need water to produce a cell phone. You need water uh, to, just to produce uh, uh, one liter of oil. You need four liters of water. So it gives you an idea. And I think that's also a sort of footprint that needs to be taken into account when we talk about the, the, the environmental impact and the water um, footprint of all of the, all the goods and the data centers, everything we're talking about. Um, now, if we go to um, the question of climate change, well, there again, we're advocating with others, with you know, countries and WWF and other partners internationally um, to, to try to, to raise awareness on the fact that uh, climate change is directly translating into a change of the hydrological cycle. Uh, so um, it's, it's, it's a fact that not really taken into consideration in climate change uh, negotiations at the moment uh, because we're still focusing very much on CO2 on um, green gas uh, emissions, uh, greenhouse gases emissions, sorry. Uh, but we're really talking about adaptation. And, and that's also, uh, there's also an information there about where we are at in the discourse because internationally speaking, we're still talking a lot about how we're going to mitigate climate change um, and we feel that we're not talking enough about how we're adapting to climate change. And, uh, but it's, it's just um, as important, but it's also uh, as overwhelming that, that, that you know, what's going on in the atmosphere is what we're doing with freshwater resources because freshwater everywhere on earth has been uh, taken for granted. And, and now we're really reaching the limits. And we're really reaching the limits because um, of how much water we're using, 
because uh, because of demographic uh, growth, uh, because of economic development, and because when uh, communities um, you know exit you know uh, poverty, which is a good thing, um, they everything changes. They have more goods. They consume differently. They eat more meat, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And for everything, you need more water. And now you add this to climate change. You add climate change to this, which is a huge disruption of the hydrological uh, uh, cycle, and uh, it it becomes quite. It can become very chaotic. And uh, I, I'm not sure about how much time I still have, uh, but um, there's one thing that I'd be very happy uh, that we talk about uh, with the other speakers and uh, during the Q and A. Uh, again, I read with a lot of interest the article on the, on the data centers and on how much water they consume. And I, I, I really agree with the, with the author on, um, on, on, their, uh, on his um, uh, analysis. And yes, metrics are very important. They need to be enforced. And just like we've been there with uh, CO2 emissions, now we're we really have to get there with fresh water. So that's really a key message, definitely. Um, and, uh, and also his analysis diagnostic of the transparency issue. People are not aware yet. They're not aware enough about how much water we're using for everything, including for data centers, of course. And, and, uh, um, and, and companies are, and not only companies, I mean, uh, about every stakeholders, you know, is is not uh, being transparent and not providing you very useful information. So this is very, very key to any progress that will be made. Um, and I, I really look forward to discuss this with the other uh, panelists and uh, and with the audience a little later. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, um, introduction to your work. It's really exciting to have your perspective. Now I'd like to invite uh, to the floor David, uh, who can tell us a bit more about water consumption specifically into the data center industry. Um, maybe a few questions to kick you off. Uh, how easy it is to make research on this topic? Uh, could you give some key observations right from your work um, in terms of water consumption level, measurement transparency, evolution trends, uh, and so on? very much absolutely so whilst i've been involved in the tech industry as a as, as a startup founder for almost 15 years now today i'm mainly speaking to you as a researcher at the center for environmental policy at imperial college here in london and also as part of the data center sustainability research team at uptime institute who are an infrastructure advisory organization that helps set many of the standards used in the data center industry now, when we think about sustainable data centers and the environmental impact of IT, most people tend to start with energy. A lot of progress has been made over the last decade, both in terms of the transition to renewable electricity generally, but also specifically within the IT industry. Uh, large data center operators like Amazon, Google, or Microsoft consistently hit the top 10 list of renewable energy buyers each year. But there are still challenges about what 100% renewables actually means. Most data center operators claiming that today are actually just greenwashing if they're only using RECs. But the momentum is certainly there. Now, the same cannot be said for water consumption, which I would say is a decade behind energy in terms of understanding, transparency and progress. However, we have to be careful when comparing resources like energy and water because the sustainability goals are not the same. Now with energy, the goal is zero carbon, but zero water is not really the right approach. Data center water consumption is highly dependent on the region because that dictates which cooling technologies can be used. Now in, cooling, in cooler regions, zero water can be achieved and that should definitely be the goal because free airflow cooling is possible for some, if not all of the year. But in many hot regions, this is simply not viable. And that's important to understand because not only is a large part of future demand growth going to come from hot regions like Africa, South America, India and Asia, but global temperatures are going to increase due to global warming in general. 
So regions that can currently use free cooling may find that it actually becomes more challenging in the future. It's also important to understand the general context for water consumption because direct consumption from data centers is only a small part of global water consumption. So for example, in the United States, 1.7 billion liters per day is directly consumed by data centers. But when you consider that total water consumption is over 1,200 billion liters per day, then the data center footprint is insignificant. However, that only tells part of the story because most of that focus is on direct consumption and over half of the daily consumption, some 500 billion liters per day in the US supports thermoelectric power consumption. This is where power plants are generating heat, generally using fossil fuels such as coal and gas, but also in nuclear fission. And that is converting water into steam, rotating a turbine and generating electricity. And with the majority of electricity generation still from fossil fuels, the transition to renewables is important for both carbon and water intensity. Only solar and wind, en wind energy do not involve water in generation. And there are estimates which suggest that by 2030, moving to wind and solar energy could reduce water withdrawals by 50% in the UK, 25% in the US, Germany and Australia, and 10% in India. This means that the true data center water footprint is linked to the source of energy, but currently this isn't considered the responsibility of data center operators, and so it generally doesn't get reported. And reporting really is limited. Data center operators are very familiar with the power usage effectiveness ratio, or PUE, which is often used as a measure of energy efficiency. And a similar metric, water usage effectiveness, exists to help understand that annual site water usage. Unfortunately, less than a third of data center operators track any water metrics and water consumption is ranked as a low priority by most. Facebook is one of the few companies operating on a global basis who, also, who, who do report WE, although Google and Microsoft and others both publish uh, total water consumption. Unfortunately, you can't actually use Facebook's infrastructure in the same way that you can with Google and Microsoft. It's all for their own applications. So the comparison is challenging there. But I do note that Scaleway does publish WE for its six data centers in Europe. Now, understanding the source of water is also necessary context to analyze any water metrics. Some would argue that where water is used, the goal should not be zero water, but zero fresh water. If water is recycled or reclaimed, then its impact is simply not the same as if all the water is drawn from municipal or freshwater sources. But this isn't revealed by consumption metrics uh, or WE. The relative water stress of a region is also not represented in these figures. Consumption numbers in a region with easy access to abundant cool water take on a very different meaning if the same numbers represent consumption in a highly water stressed region. Now all this shows how nuanced the discussion around data center water consumption is, which goes some way to explain why data center operators have so far been reluctant to reveal much. It's far easier for a layperson to understand zero carbon compared to what is needed to understand the context of water consumption. And this means much of the media coverage around data center water focuses on highly emotive topics like access to drinking water and pollution from water treatment. And it seems the current approach from operators is to avoid publishing any numbers at all, so there's nothing for anyone to focus on or report. Now, this reluctance is going to have to change because the full environmental impact of IT is getting more and more attention. Mainstream media is starting to report on water consumption, particularly where data centers are the largest user in a particular region. For example, this is something that was in the news recently in Holland and local residents groups in the US have made similar complaints in recent years. Sometimes this is about entirely new projects, but expansion of existing sites has also been challenged as they grow to meet the ever expanding growth of IT. 
Now is the window of opportunity for data center operators. The regulation is still limited, particularly around disclosures, but that is something that's going to change. So operators need to get ahead of the reporting requirements by ensuring that they have reliable metering and a plan for water efficiency that can be implemented over the coming years in the conjunction with renewable energy projects. And renewable energy really is the model to copy because these projects are now very often seen as positive news stories and data center owners have taken advantage of that to show off their sustainability credentials. And really the same could be done for water. Facebook likes to talk a lot about its restoration projects for local watersheds and ecosystems. And Google's Finland data center is quite famous for being located in the snowy north, having taken over an old mill so it can use the cold lake water. But if nothing is done, then mainstream pressure will grow. And that is what politicians respond to. I'm sure data center operators would prefer to deal with this challenge on their own terms. But if they don't, then politics will do it for them. And that will probably not result in as favorable, favorable outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, David, for this uh, fantastic contribution. I think uh, we all learned a lot and that is not necessarily black and white in terms of uh, how to perceive these big announcements made by um, some of the companies offering uh, a lot of uh, data centers as a service. Now I'd like to invite um, actually another perspective of Arnaud de Birmingham uh, to and here essentially uh, to what extent do you share David's assessment? Is it really a mission impossible to get to a point where we get zero water data centers by 2030 in Europe? And what is from your industry knowledge um, the approach we should be taking? Hello, everyone. And thank you very much for, for the organization. Uh, so now it will be the French accent. <laughs> um, a few words about, uh, about Scaleway. We are a Paris-based uh, company. We are, we are a part of Iliad Group. Iliad Group is very uh, well known in France because it's owner of free telecom operator. So we are also in, uh, in France a uh, 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 telecom operator. We, are, we exist since 22 years now. And we are one of the last triple play um, cloud provider to offer at the same time data center with colocation space, uh, dedicated server, so it's more infrastructure and servers, and a fully elastic public cloud uh, infrastructure. And we are actually the only one in Europe and as a European company to do all these three parts internally and to do it since uh, now 22 years. Um, we are in a very particular um, industry uh, because, to be uh, very honest and to know this uh, this industry since a long time, data center didn't change so much since 20 years. Um, with with you know with the adoption of the cloud, all the world, uh, all the IT. Uh, moved from companies to the cloud and to data center. So the demand for data center is very huge everywhere in Europe. And you can see, for example, Amsterdam just decided to stop uh, to construct uh, any new data center. And there is a lot, and there is more and more cities who decide to, 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 to calm down the growing of data center. Data center are mission critical infrastructure. And they have a direct impact to the economy. So it's it's a, it's a very important part of the invisible cloud. cloud. On the cloud, there is nothing which is virtual. It's a real and concrete infrastructure, it's industrial infrastructure. And because of the impact uh, in terms of power consumption, and there is a lot of other impact, we have to take care of this infrastructure. And we, we still have to, to never have any troubles with this infrastructure. What I, what I want to say is since 20 years, we do exactly the same things for data center and we didn't, the market did not innovate at all. We are still using air conditioning, we are using waste floor, we still need a temperature of 20 degrees uh, inside the data center. Nothing changed, uh, there is no innovation. And there's few reasons for this. Uh, most of European um, companies uh, for data center and most of the tech companies in data center have been bought for the four last years by 
very big and huge real estate American companies. And you know, for real estate companies, uh, innovation is a risk. Uh, they just want to, to build a data center with an investment and to be sure to have earning during a long time. But innovation is a risk. And because all the market is not consolidated by two or three big, huge funds, uh, innovation still they still doing nothing, nothing new. We still do exactly the same since 20 years and nobody, uh, nobody wants to change uh, because there's too, too many risks. But we did, we, we did a lot, of, uh, a lot of innovation. We are still working very lot. We are working a lot to change things and to, to, to let understand everybody that there is a lot of things to do with data center because um, we manage a lot of energy. There is a lot of things to do in terms of efficiency and there's a lot of things to do with water consumption. Um, innovation must, we, we, we have to take care of innovation. If we, are, if we have a clear field for innovation for data center and if we change the law, if we need it, innovation will, will come again and we will be able to change the technology. The water consumption for data center is mostly came from two things. The first thing is uh, the cooling tower. Uh, in Europe, we don't need any cooling tower. Our climate in Europe, we can use dry cooling. If, you, if we are using air conditioning, we, are, we can do dry cooling. We don't need cooling tower. So in Europe, yes, we can have a zero water consumption for data center. We don't need to use billions and billions of fresh water for data center. There is no need. The technology is here. The climate in Europe is okay for this. So there is no reason. The only reason to, 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 to do cooling tower in Europe is just to not change what we usually do, uh, nothing else. So I think on European side, we, we can change things. <laughs> we can change a lot of things. Um, so the investor need to be reassuring because they manage the risk and they have to they have to believe and to, to be confident to take risk and innovation. The specification must change and the regulation need to inform me. Uh, we, we see more and more clients who are still asking for 20 degrees inside the data center. We don't need 20 degrees inside the data center. The ASHRAE norms, uh, TC 9.9, since six or seven years, we can cool server with 30 degrees and it's a big step and with 30 degrees inside the data center it's a massive a massive uh, massive change in terms of uh, power efficiency and water efficiency and we need to be transparent we need to publish everything we need to publish the PUE, the we and we need as possible to to give some uh, some key values on product side for example, a client who is just taking a server uh, on our company or just an inets instances, we, we should be we should be able to give him okay your power consumption is ta 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 your water consumption for this resource is ta 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 and we we should be able to give the, this all, all this information in real time. Transparency, transparency is a key, uh, and because the sector and all data center don't want to be transparent in terms of water consumption is quite a big, uh, big misunderstanding. And uh, there is a lot of greenwashing uh, around data center. So transparency is a key. We already published since a long time uh, all the PUE of our data center in France. And uh, I think it must be a near rule. Everybody must do it because some practice uh, in terms of water consumption will be automatically banned if they need to be uh, published. Uh, because nobody will understand why a data center in Amsterdam use three or four billion uh, cubic water, cubic, uh, cubic liters of uh, water every month. It's impossible to understand. So our perspective is to be uh, fully transparent, uh, to, to continue to fight against greenwashing and the lack of uh, data about data center. Water consumption uh, must be taken as a, energy efficiency is exactly the same. The WUE uh, is like the PUE, it must be transparent. And uh, we want to be an example in Europe uh, for, for all these two values. 
Uh, also, innovation is, uh, as I said, something very important. Uh, there is no technical limitation in Europe to not use any water. Uh, there is uh, a lot of uh, massive waste uh, included uh, inside all these indicators. Um, we also have a huge experience with DC5 data center where we don't use any air conditioning. Uh, we are we demonstrated a long time ago that we are able uh, in Europe to do a data center without any air conditioning and fully compatible with most of uh, requirement by clients and big uh, cloud infrastructure. And uh, at least I would like to say that Europe is a wide scale uh, to act uh, with an impact because uh, because there's a lot of things to do and transparency is really the key for, for all the subject of water. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this introduction. I uh, really appreciate uh, the perspective and uh, fully agree with you that greenwashing is something that needs to be definitely eradicated and put more in the prime because I think many people also lose the possibility to engage with the topic because they don't necessarily know what to identify as greenwashing. So hopefully we can cover this in the Q&A. Uh, for the last but definitely not the least uh, intervention, I would like to invite Manuel um, who actually can give us a bit of a different perspective. Uh, the fight against climate change and the water preservation issues uh, we're discussing are uh, typical phenomena that can be better addressed at the continental scale um, as their impacts unfortunately go beyond our own um, CO2 emissions, our own uh, negative impacts. So the EU has been leading uh, the climate change fight, uh, all the setups that we have, the Green Deal, have really given us confidence that uh, our continent is going to be the one setting up the scene for the whole planet. Um, and I think, uh, given we have the topic uh, of the day, focus on that, can you tell us a bit more about the European Commission ambitions um, and on what type of public uh, policy your team, uh, which follows uh, cloud computing and all green topics related to that, is concretely working on? Um, thank you very much, Lubomila. Thanks a lot for the uh, um, uh, introduction and good afternoon to everyone. Um, I um, um, not that I mind being the, the the last one to speak, but I um, I, I feel under pressure given how, how um, uh, proficient my uh, uh, the previous speakers were and. Um, I, I need to say that I agree with uh, many, many of the things that have uh, that have been said by by uh, by all of you. Um, I need to confess as well that um, um, data center efficiency panels is something I do uh, quite often, um, and um, but this one is quite particular because it's the uh, the, the first one I've had to uh, to uh, to dig for new information and and, and dig for. Uh, um, uh, for data, because it's true that the uh, dimension of water is almost never touched on. I, uh, uh, it's something we uh, at the Commission look at, um, but it's the first time ever uh, that I uh, uh, that I've seen a data center and water uh, topic coming uh, uh, together, and not only that, but uh, as well having uh, specialists on on that particular area. So I'm I'm particularly uh, uh, grateful about uh, this. Um, the um so 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 let me share at least what i've uh, what i've learned uh, uh in my uh, uh, in my research and i think what what is very interesting whether you dig a little bit and of course I, i've come across the, uh, the the work that david uh, uh, carries and and his article but is really this interdependency in between water and uh, and energy um, so today we're talking about data centers, but water is really used throughout the energy industry. So um, uh, you, 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 you don't produce, and, and David gave some figures, uh, you don't produce energy without consuming water at some point, sometimes in the infrastructure, very often as well in the, in the running cost. But then as well, the water sector needs energy um, to be collected, pumped, treated, desinalized in some cases. Uh, um, and 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 it's quite uh, uh, my, my colleagues who from uh, environmental uh, action uh, from the environmental policies uh, speak of a nexus in between energy and uh, and water. I think the figures are quite uh, interesting uh, as well, and, and and David mentioned quite a few of them. I, I like to uh, the uh, I like to put in parallel the the, the the following figures in 
in 2018, in the EU, data centers accounted for 2.7% of electricity demand. Um, that's quite high. That's uh, quite high. And at the same time, um, it still flies below the radar of some other uh, uh, usages. Um, it's a figure that uh, we've studied and uh, uh, in, in the preparation of today's panel, uh, it was linked to, as part of the, the, the reading material. It's a figure which is meant to increase to 3.2 um, by 2030 uh, if we continue on the current uh, trajectory. On the, um, on the other side, the, uh, the same figures for water is that um, uh, about 2% of uh, uh, the uh, electricity produced in the EU goes towards water. Um, one point, uh, uh, and, and this is, can be split in two, about 1% of the uh, electricity produced in the EU goes into the distribution and, and treatment of water. And then the other percent uh, goes into uh, uh, dealing with uh, uh, urban waste uh, treatment. So the, uh, the, 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 the cleaning of the water, if you want, after, after usage. So I think that was very uh, um, uh, enlightening for me to, uh, to see. And um, once I'm done in the chat, I'll link the, to, to the full study that presents this, uh, this nexus. Um, but now to the core of, uh, of what we do. Um, me and my, uh, and my team, we work in, um, uh, in a objective that we embedded in the uh, uh, digital strategy of a year ago, which is that by 2030, European data centers should be uh, climate neutral, highly energy efficient and sustainable. Um, so I think it gives justice to what my uh, um, uh, preceding uh, speakers said this afternoon, that uh, energy efficiency is predominant. It's there explicitly in the objective. Um, but it as well uh, gives credit to the idea that um, energy is not the only angle. And on the, the sustainability uh, 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 objective of this, object, of, of this objective, um, you, can, uh, you can see the, the, the water. Um, the, um, uh, so this is only an objective. This is not yet, uh, if you want, an instrument to, uh, to arrive there. Um, we're looking very much uh, into what France is currently doing because they've uh, adopted a, a, an approach which um, uh, was presented earlier uh, in, by Mr. Thibault, um, but which we've not retained in terms of, of structuring the, 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 our, our laws, if you want, uh, which is to do something specific about the greening of the digital sector. Um, what we are instead doing is keep on renewing our green instruments and progressively bringing on board uh, digital related elements in them. Um, as you know, the, uh, um, uh, the Commission, sorry, the, the, the European Union has now agreed for the uh, carbon uh, emission reductions by 2030. Um, it's minus 55%, leading to a hundred, uh, I mean, to a carbon neutral economy by 2050. But so this is the intermediate target of 2030, minus 55. Um, and in, uh, uh, by mid July, the, uh, 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 the, the European Commission will make then a set of uh, legislative proposals to um, uh, to reach that uh, that objective. So this is the so-called fit for 55 uh, um, 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 package uh, to be seen as minus 55% and not as a, a program for healthy aging of, uh, of, uh, of people. Um, um, so, so this is where, um, you know, I'm not going to dive into the specifics of something which has not yet been adopted by the Commission, but this is a place where um, you could see uh, uh, some of the, the things. Um, but, but maybe there's a number of, uh, of things here which um, are, are, you know, I, I need to mention them and then if there are questions, I, I can dive into them. We have a number of uh, uh, regulations and legislations which are already in place, which some are about to be reviewed, some others not, but which are highly relevant in this, uh, in this context. Um, 
we have um, uh, there's uh, our research department the joint research center is maintaining a EU code of conduct for uh, data centers and energy efficiency um, this is something which has uh, exists since uh, 12 years I believe 12 13 years um, and and it's something which is um, um, comes from a scientific research but which has helped a lot to uh, to to pave the way um, we have uh, an eco-design regulation on servers and data storage products. So this is really looking inside of a data center. You know, how can servers and, and data storage equipment be uh, 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 designed in a more uh, eco-friendly uh, manner? Uh, we have a, an energy efficiency directive, and this one is part of the things that are being reviewed, which deals uh, among others with energy audits, which deals among others with the purchasing by central uh, governments of uh, 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 um, green items. Um, and this is an area which again is being reviewed and which could integrate new, uh, new aspects uh, very soon. Um, Europe has now since a few months um, a, a very important uh, 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 regulation which is called the taxonomy regulation which regulates how green uh, bonds uh, or, or green or of how investments can be labeled as green so say that tomorrow Arnaud wants to borrow money on the markets to build a new data center um, he needs to borrow money and he wants this borrowing of money to be labeled as green he will have to comply with the taxonomy regulation and there's a specific uh, uh, chapter if you want that uh, in this regulation that tells him uh, how his data center uh, the norms to which his data center needs uh, to fulfill to uh, uh, to be labeled uh, uh, green um, there's a, a proposal on the table, uh, a review of the so-called Directive on Non-Financial Reporting, which is a, a proposal for a Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. Um, it's the idea that um, uh, companies obviously uh, report on their financial results, um, but are now, um, uh, with the new um, proposal would have to report uh, equally on their uh, social and environmental uh, dimension. And this is something we believe, um, Arnaud was mentioning earlier, elements of transparency, and we believe that this is, that this goes, uh, 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 can go a long way if it goes, uh, if it goes uh, uh, forward. Um, um, we do have, uh, so I'm not going to, uh, to, to, to detail each and every one of them. We do have as well uh, public procurement criteria, which are, uh, uh, as it says, criteria to guide public procurers in their purchasing, and some of them are specific to, uh, uh, to data center. Um, public procurement is 17% of procurement in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. So you can imagine the, the snowball effect that a, a, a virtuous uh, a public sector uh, uh, can have on, uh, on that. Um, and, um, and finally, there's a, a couple of instruments which are not on the top of the, uh, 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 of the news at the moment because they're not necessarily being reviewed, but uh, chief among them, I, I consider that the uh, WE directive, so the waste of electrical and electronic equipment, uh, which is how material, uh, how wasted uh, material should be uh, decommissioned and reused and, uh, and things like this. Um, so with this, I'd like to stop. I'm, of course, very glad to take an, any questions and dive into uh, uh, all aspects. And I'm really glad that uh, uh, we get to speak about uh, water and data centers today. Thank you so much for this uh, fantastic contribution. Now it's time for us to speak to one another. Uh, to start off the discussion, I would first like to invite you um, to maybe make a kind of contributing comments based on what the others said. Uh, you all referred to one another's speeches, but maybe there was something else you wanted to emphasize. If not, otherwise we jump straight away into the Q&A. Yes, marie -Laure. Thank you very much for all the other speakers. It was uh, very interesting again for me. Um, I wanted to, to react uh, to, uh, to some research. I mean, to, first to, the, to David's article, uh, now that he's spoken and others have spoken, uh, I think uh, you know it's time to uh, to comment on on some on parts of it. Uh, one thing that I found very interesting about the data centers that I didn't know is that uh, a lot of big data centers 
companies are going to um, are, are, are going to have like big centers and also are going. I'm going to, not going to use the right terms, but and then are going to have uh, small data centers uh, closer to their markets or to their um, yeah edge. Their, yeah it's edge right. <laughs> and so for me, this is really one one strategic entry to to mitigate the water footprint. Uh, because um, again, water is, well, it's a global concern. Um, and uh, there's a lot to be said about uh, virtual water and water footprint, uh, which is basically the water you're using to produce a service or to produce something. Uh, but there, there is a responsibility um, for the companies when they actually choose the location of their data center, because they're going to use uh, in many parts of the world where they can't uh, rely on the weather, on the on the climate of that region, they're going to be used to, to rely on um, on groundwater there, and um, and and I would say that uh, the service provided the services provided by by uh, data centers are really considered a priority um in many countries and and rightly so as uh arno and everybody agrees we all use them and we all i mean the economy is extremely dependent on them and we all are um but then we're talking we have to talk about the the conflicts of usage you know um and in some places it's a very it's a very acute and relevant question in, in others less so but in some and many parts of the world as we're going to have more and more data centers um, it's actually really a big question, um, and a big question uh, that's you know that's uh, very relevant for all sorts of uh, industry. Uh, but I see that this is really uh, we know there's going to there's going to be more and more data centers, um, and that as we actually lower water consumption in other areas, it's a figure that I didn't use earlier in my presentation. Well, actually, in my <laughs> not presentation, but uh, that at the global level, just to give you an idea, we use 70% of water for agriculture. Uh, and we know there's a, a very, a lot of leverage there to lower the footprint, but still we're more and more on this planet and uh, eating more and better. And so there is some leverage to decrease the water footprint of food production, but uh, to a certain extent, um, then it's actually 22 for the industry all industry um, together and 8% for uh, cities and domestic use. So um, I, what I foresee is that data centers are going to claim more and more of the, of the footprint, which, you know, and, and that there is some leverage to, to lower that footprint in other industries and other areas. Uh, but it's really something to have in mind. And I, I, really, I really welcome the initiative of uh, Scaleway. Also, I, I did some homework after reading the article and, um, and I went on the website of the um, Alliance for Water Stewardship that David might know. And actually, the, the only um, GAFA that was there was Google. So that actually confirmed what he was saying in his article uh, that, uh, uh, and, and, and then, you know, Alliance of Water Stewardship is just one, but it's an illustration. It was very interesting that there were, there were no other uh, worldwide players from that industry um, that were actually subscribing to the Alliance for Water Stewardship. Amazing. Thank you so much for this. Um, so I would like to kick off the uh, kind of Q&A and discussion um, with, uh, first of all, thank you all for the fact that you gave such a description of what the challenge ahead of us is and move on to actually uh, go kind of seeing what has moved our audience and made them excited about the topic. Um, first question is to Arnaud, uh, Scaleway publishes figures for CO2 um, on their pages. I see WE published, uh, but how can I see water uh, per kilowatt hour in liters in the same way? So it is on the definition WUE is uh, the number of liters of water used for one kilowatt. So it is WUE. Short and clear. 
uh, <laughs> if, you know, if it's, uh, if it's clear, it's clear. Uh, moving on to the question from Karim Berbari, uh, what are some concrete solutions to reduce water consumption or even uh, recirculate it back into the system within data centers? Is this possible? Anyone would like to uh, maybe shed some light on this? I don't know if somebody can answer to this question. No? Okay. Um, how to recirculate uh, the water used by your data center? Okay. We have, everybody has to understand that when we use water for a data center, it's because they are not using a dry cooling system. A dry cooling system is like your car. On your car, you have a, you have a heat exchanger with a fan. It's a dry cooling process. We are putting some hair. There is a radiator and uh, we exchange heat like this. When data center use water, it's, it's because they are using cooling tower. It's like your shower. Your shower is very hot at the top and it's cold on the down. It's exactly the same. So they spray some water on top. There is some hair which is circulating on the other way. And uh, with this process, it's cooled down uh, the liquid instead of a dry cooling system. And we can't use any more this water because it's hot water, which is sprayed inside hair. And this water is in direct contact with air. And in this case, there is some bacteria, which is uh, growing inside this water. And this water can't be used anymore. We put some uh, chemicals in order to not have all these bacteria because these bacteria are very dangerous for human people. It's what we call um, Legionella. Uh, we had a uh, hundred of deaths in France uh, 15 years ago uh, because we had a big scandal in France. So uh, cooling tower are near forbidden in France. But in other parts in Europe, we still use cooling tower a lot for data center, for hospital, for office. And you have to understand that this water is polluted by uh, chemicals and there is some bacteria you can't use anymore this water. Everybody will say the opposite, but uh, I am doing this business since 20 years and uh, I know that this water can't be used anymore. It, uh, this is the level of uh, uh, how knowledgeable uh, CEOs and founders of companies should be about the environmental elements of their business. So much appreciated and I think it's setting the scene well for many. Um, we have a question for Manuel. Uh, will the European Commission look at the other indicators that the PUE uh, in its future Green Data Center initiative? Um, uh, thank you, Lubomila. And yes, I've seen indeed the, uh, the, the, the question in the chat. Um, the, um, so the, 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 the very short answer is yes. Um, uh, the, 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 the slightly longer answer is um, uh, PUE itself has, um, in itself, without looking at water, has got quite a bit of limitations. Um, so, so it's not only about looking as well into water, but it's as, it, it is as well about looking at uh, how to, uh, um, uh, you know, go beyond PUE as the, the measurement for energy efficiency in itself. And once we're at it, let's look at the whole. Um, um, let's look at the whole metric range including water so so pue has been you know an industry standard but uh, but should not uh, remain uh, forever and 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 i hope that the practices will will evolve we're currently finishing a study on on that and having a validation workshop tomorrow especially about the the, the metrics in particular about the metrics and uh, and i hope to make progress here i think what, what we're finding out is that the the metrics are, uh, already exist right they're already standardized they're just not used by the industry so there might be a, a matter of not really reinventing the wheel because it's it's already there but just uh, attach it properly to the uh, to the car and and, and push it down, down the road um, so uh, water user uh, we already exist but there's already as well some uh, uh, other metrics on the uh, use of uh, reuse of heat and the reuse of, and the use of renewables um, which is not very much used by the industry um, and uh, and all those things could absolutely be integrated so i think we'll look into it in a in a, in a broad sense uh, when we uh, 
when we move forward and when we push the industry. Because earlier, I think David mentioned that there's room for um, um, uh, uh, self-regulatory approaches. And those are things that exist out there. And you don't need a, a European initiative to, uh, to have uh, uh, the corporate world move, uh, move by itself. Uh, maybe a comment on, on, on Marie-Laure's comment earlier about uh, the, the development of edge computing. And I think this is a very uh, uh, important development for the, for the data center industry in, uh, in general. Um, but but for the, it first shows that it's still a sector which is in uh, uh, expanding and developing. And I think when, when a sector is growing, it gives opportunities to, uh, uh, to improve along the way. Um, uh, infrastructure, as opposed to the to the servers themselves, tend to be built for rather 20, 30 years long. So, so um, uh, it's 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 important to get it well from day one. It's very difficult to retrofit installations once they've been uh, uh, built. Um, so, so I think this is somewhere where uh, where we want to uh, to. Uh, um, uh, you know, the, the sooner we act, the sooner we will be able to to affect those new uh, uh, developments. I think it's fair to say as well that, uh, you know, uh, uh, we understand from today's discussion that the practices uh, uh, in the industry are very different, right? Some are are more looking at energy, some others more at water, some are, are trying to, 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 to get the best of, of both worlds. Um, um, but it's fair to say as well that there's a part of the data center operators who are not looking at, at, at none of this, right? It's the, the old uh, data centers, if you want, the, the very often privately owned in, a, in, a, in the basement very often and this is uh, where it gets complicated they're very often owned by the public sector uh, and they've had difficulties to uh, um, uh, lack of incentive to move to uh, professional installations lack of investment lack of priority i mean think about the data center in the basement of a university or an hospital their priority is to teach to students or to uh, treat patients uh, not to reduce their uh, um, uh, energy footprint, and uh, and so part of the part of the answer for the the worst performing actors uh, is as well about professionalizing their uh, data centers uh, in uh, in in general. So um, uh, so those are all axes on which we're working, and uh, notably with. Uh, with uh, the wallet uh, through different instruments that I could detail here, but it would take me a, a long time. But this is a very important dimension too. Fantastic, thank you. I have a question that I believe is more most uh, um, kind of perfect for Marie-Laure. What is uh, uh, the definition of fresh water? Would untreated surface waters and groundwaters uh, be considered fresh water along with potable supplies? Would reclaim water that is sufficient to meet uh, WHA, WHO potable standards count as fresh water? So, um, in a nutshell, what is fresh water? <laughs> if you can unmute, just uh, sorry. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Sorry. Um, so, fresh water is. Um, uh, is something different area I mean, you can you cannot say that fresh water is clean water fresh water is is the the, the water that flows naturally um, in the uh, environment and that we um, yeah that we use uh, and potable water is uh, always treated and you can also even even when you you take you take water from the environment, uh, you have to definitely have to treat it. Um, there is uh, you know you have uh, hundreds of uh, millions of people who actually rely on water. In some cases, you would think it's it's clean because it's uh, it's in the environment and the environment is not particularly polluted, but it's uh, it's not portable. Thank you for this. Uh, great. So um, we have another question uh, that is uh, about edge computing. I think some of it was actually covered, but maybe this would be a short intervention. Don't you think that the deployment of edge computing will change the data center's architecture and foster innovation? 
Arnaud, David? Yeah, yeah, David, it'll be great. Yeah, please. <laughs> So I think it really depends on what you define as edge computing. And I'm somewhat cynical about that definition because often it just means a data center in a big city. Mm -hmm. um, having a data center in London is not the edge as far as I'm concerned, um, but many providers consider that, um, that to be the case. I think a good example is how it is Google. And I, I use this example in my, uh, my Nature article. Um, so at the end of 2020, Google has listed on their website 21 data centers. They publish the PUE figure for 17 of those, but they have well over a hundred points of presence or pops all around the world. And that's really why I consider it to be the definition of the edge. It's a, a node or multiple nodes located quite close to users. And the example that telcos love to use is a data center that's connected to some kind of uh, edge um, base station that mobile phones are then connected to. And that is really the edge. Uh, it's it's giving you a trade-off between latency, which is important for a very sub, a very small subset of applications, and cost. Because what we're actually seeing is a reduction in total number of data centers globally, but an increase in hyperscale data centers. And this is a major challenge for water consumption because instead of having a large number of very inefficient but small data centers drawing some water from, from an ecosystem, you have a much smaller number of very large data centers, which can make up a huge proportion of the total water consumption in a region. And what we've seen at uptime, talking to some of these large operators, is that none of them are looking at um, the availability of water other than is it available. And usually that means is it municipal water, because that is the most reliable source of water. And generally, that's the only thing that a data center operator is interested in when it comes to water. However, some of them are looking at whether they are going to be the largest user of water in a particular area. And if that is the case, they're deciding not to locate in that region because they don't want to be seen as the largest water user, but also they don't want to place additional stress. And I think what we need to move to is more of a consideration for the overall availability in, in the region in terms of the water stress. It, as, I, as I said earlier, it's a very different thing locating a data center in a region that has available access to abundant water, let's say next, next to a, a massive lake where really the water consumption is, is not going to be a problem um, compared to, let's say, locating a data center um, in a region that is growing in terms of its IT demand, um, but has a lot of challenges um, to the environment and Africa is a great example uh, just because of the natural climate there and the the heat and the just the challenges of accessing water really good uh, contribution um, may I just add like a follow-on question if you look at the data centers that you've been able to analyze and observe uh, can you give an example of a good location or essentially like even just a, a few kind of success stories, so to say, from the perspective of environmental cost versus also obviously, um, yeah, the rest. It's really difficult to give um, a, a binary answer to that, a good location <laughs> or a bad, bad location. And I suppose this is just a good example of how complicated these challenges are, because you need to think about um, availability of staff to build the data center on a temporary basis, potentially a couple of years. You then need staff on a permanent basis who are able to live in an area that they want to live to run the data center. You need access to energy and at the scale that hyperscale data centers operate at, that often means completely new transmission infrastructure from the electricity grid, uh, just because of the, the scale of electricity that is required into the data center. And then what we're starting to see is people considering how that electricity is generated and there are some big projects that have been announced around building brand new wind farms and solar farms um, and you have to have those in certain regions um, but also where that is not possible the water intensity of the electricity in that region which can vary significantly um, even with sources that you might consider to be renewable such as hydropower that uses a lot of water because it is entirely generated through and um, through water but it's even that is not that simple because if the water is just being evaporated from a reservoir that is quite different from if the water is just cycling through a data center and then going on for downstream users and you might say that your impact there is, is zero 
So un unfortunately, there isn't a, a good answer to that question. <laughs> That was a good answer to the question, I guess. <laughs> Is uh, um, There's an interesting question that I think could be uh, applicable to all of you, um, and it is about awareness. I know you mentioned earlier about greenwashing. Uh, there's been also messages uh, that uh, Manuel gave us in terms of how the Commission is thinking about the larger size of the problem. Um, what are the plans to raise a public awareness to the issue, and how do you ensure transparency and reporting uh, um, so anyone that is interested in responding is welcome to take this one. Maybe, then, maybe I can I can start. I mean, uh, this is just Manuel, not the Commission speaking. But I think the, <laughs> the, the the way it works is that it should be an end to end transparency, right? It should be, um, um, you know, I think uh, uh, citizens more and more are. Uh, asking to to be aware of their environmental footprint in general and um, but to get that knowledge um, so of course if there are direct clients of data centers uh, Arnaud will provide them the information but most of the uh, uh, services that Arnaud is is giving to the citizens go actually through other providers through the banks through the retailers through through the ones who are in direct contact with the citizens. And so um, by end-to-end -end transparency, I, I mean that one way or another, when Arnaud gives transparency to the bank, the bank then needs to embed that element into its own um, um, uh, environmental footprint calculation and then pass it on to its, uh, uh, to its uh, uh, final customer, the, the, the citizen. And, and I think so, you know, this is in, with two stakeholders, uh, 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 an oversimplification, but I think this is how it, uh, it should work. Whether it should work through uh, legislation or not is uh, it's something else. Um, but where, where, what is clear is that the, the question of metrics comes once again uh, uh, and the standardized way through which this can be done is, is, uh, is essential. Um, and uh, and so I think this is extremely important. I think the the industry works with a scope one, two, and three. And uh, when uh, uh, the scope one and two of Arnaud are the scope threes of his um, uh, customers, right? So so I think it really works as a you really need to look at the whole supply chain to get that that information. And I think in this debate, there's there's a, a thing which is not I think helping the debate. I mean, maybe sometimes, you know, just to push a bit everyone, is when I see those um, those uh, uh, eye-catching headlines which say, oh, uh, watching a movie on this or this platform will consume as much as a flight to uh, uh, to Thailand. No, sorry, it doesn't. Uh, um, uh, Arnaud reminded us earlier the, the, the environmental footprint of a, of a flight from Paris to Nice. Um, it, it's orders of magnitude different from the ones uh, of watching a two hours a stream movie, even in 4K. Um, so, so you know, the, the, the figures, then if you look at the figures of the airline industry versus the, the digital industry, this is where you can uh, draw comparisons, right? But, but we need to be careful as well about the uh, eye-catching headlines that sometimes uh, 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 are there and are not very helpful to make the, the, the debate progress. I'm 100% uh, agree with you, Manuel, and uh, you already know it. And uh, I strongly believe on open data also for these kind of things. Maybe uh, most of the large electricity intensive and water intensive uh, industrial and companies should be, it should be mandatory. And all the scope one and two, it should be uh, available to everybody on open data in order to let uh, everybody to be able to, to compute all this data and to give a clear information to everybody of his own uh, impacts. And, uh, I think this can be something very interesting, uh, very interesting work to give transparency and uh, to make it mandatory. If I can allow myself a comment here, as someone that owns a company for carbon accounting for businesses, uh, uh, I totally agree with you. The only issue is that at the moment we're still battling for access to conversion factors. Uh, and there's uh, gatekeepers and companies that we pay money to access these conversion factors and databases. So 
uh, Manuel, if uh, the European Commission is also available to uh, support on that, I think there's plenty of uh, need uh, on that side because this is actually blocking the possibility for companies to calculate their carbon emissions because they need to go through this tedious process of paying 15k uh, to essentially access a database that gives them millions of conversion factors that they use literally a tiny little chunk from but that's how the business model is so you follow um so i have an interesting question related to agriculture from uh simon uh if agriculture and industry are the main water consumption sectors is it really so much of the relevance right now to tackle data center water consumption instead of focusing on the biggest chunk of the problem so effectively i know are you going into the agriculture business anytime soon uh, otherwise, I, Marie, can, yes, I can try. Go, go ahead. <laughs> well, the, the, I, I I try to I try to answer this earlier, but uh, you know there is a, there is some margin on, on some leverage on in the on the agricultural side, um, but uh, but again, to what extent? You know, because we're still. Uh, more and more numerous on Earth, and um, and uh, we're, you, you know, we're, you know, as as countries and and communities accede to better diets and and more goods, as they exit poverty, they they use more and more water. So there is some leverage, but not that much. So this, really the approach should be uh, should be to to take it very seriously. Perhaps I can add to that that it's it's right that data centers don't use much water generally, but this is where the context is important. And um, for two factors, the first is the water stress in the region that the data center is located in. As I said earlier, it doesn't matter so much if a data center is next to an abundant source of water. It's where it's located that is key and the stress in that region. Uh, and then secondly, it's it's not just the direct consumption, which is what everyone looks at when we're thinking, oh, data centers don't use much water relative to everything else. They do when you consider all of the water that's required to generate the electricity. And this is why it's important to link water consumption with renewable electricity and, and the overall transition there, because by moving to wind and solar, uh, we can try and reduce that water intensity not to zero but almost to zero yeah i mean and generally speaking i'm not used to thinking in terms of direct consumption of uh data centers so i'm really talking about the, the overall footprints myself um and um they're very interesting there there's a lot has been written uh on uh water economics um, and there's an important concept called uh, virtual water, among others. Um, you know, and it's really the water you need. It need you need to to um, how much water is being used, how much water is being imported, um, etc. And um, it's a very, very important concept because we are more and more interconnected, and we use goods or services that are being produced elsewhere in the world. Um, and so it's uh, very, very important that this that this become more visible um, in policies and also in uh, business plans. <laughs> the externality needs to be integrated. <laughs> Amazing. Um, I think we we only have time for uh, one more question, and um, I think um, I will try to ask the question of. Uh, um, Mr. Maillet, uh, are you working with INR, um, institute uh, uh, org, uh, in order to evaluate those indicators about those subjects, people, innovation, nature? Uh, how do you normalize indices, indicators? If I understand correctly, it's more, uh, you know, we're talking here about water. There's other elements that need to be uh, analyzed, probably biodiversity and so on. Uh, is there uh, a way to look into this and uh, maybe to tackle it according to the different segments that could be covered here? Uh, um, how do you, as a company, for example, as Scaleway, uh, looking into this topic and maybe um, um, for the rest, like, uh, how do you think this should be integrated in the way um, organizations, companies, individuals look at these things as part of their decision making? 
David, do you want to start? I saw you nodding. Yes. So, <laughs> sorry. About that. Um, um, so, I think this is this is the the ultimate challenge, really, because sustainable data centers for the last decade has meant electricity, and that's about it. Um, energy efficiency has been a part of that, um, and those are two things that go uh, go together hand in hand. Uh, but energy is just one aspect of the footprint of a data center, and whilst there is a lot of focus on the carbon side of things, which can encompass a lot more, including water and the um, embodied carbon in the building of the data centers. There are other things. And this this all goes part of thinking about the circular economy, really, which kind of captures everything. It's the waste, uh, the manufacturing, uh, all the materials and the metals that go into production of electronic items and then how those are recycled. And then thinking about the energy system of the future, batteries are going to be really important and whilst we talk about moving to 100% renewables as the goal there's going to be a lot of challenges with the chemistry and the materials that go into supporting a grid that is reliable uh, and that requires things like batteries to provide the backup power when um, wind and solar aren't available because ultimately data centers are there to provide critical infrastructure, as Arnold said, and that means reliability is, is essentially the number one consideration. And um, when you are purchasing space in a data center or a service, you're um, you're buying not just that space, but you're also provide you're also buying a service level agreement, and there's often a lot of money um, involved in those contracts to make sure that services are available. If you just think of the cost to uh, organizations like Google, if Google search is down or Amazon, if um, the online shopping is down, this is why there's a, a real economic um, economic cost behind that. And if we can't produce uh, an electricity grid that's reliable and sources of water that are reliable, then data center operators are just going to continue ignoring sustainability. Absolutely. Anyone else would like to uh, add a comment? No. Great. Well, we're perfectly on time, uh, finishing off a fantastic discussion that shed some light on an important topic. Um, I think this is a really good example of uh, the increasing sophistication of understanding of sustainability um, and kind of this more um, universal uh, picture about looking into businesses, into organizations. Uh, this is a very necessary discussion. It's one that uh, hopefully has given many uh, of the people from the audience a different perspective of how they are building their companies, what kind of services they should be looking to uh, support when they choose their data centers and what are the aspects and maybe questions they can pose to companies uh, uh, that offer a data service. Uh, and with this, I would like to say thank you to all of you. It was really wonderful to listen to your inputs and it's really great to have this uh, kind of four-sided perspective that uh, puts together on one table the different stakeholders that uh, are, at the end of the day, the reason why we're going to find a solution. Um, and with this in mind, I would uh, also offer to the audience the opportunity to uh, check out the summary of the event, which is going to come out on the Scareway uh, channels uh, in the coming uh, days. Thank you so much and have a wonderful evening.